This week in our series of how to be an objective-based investors, we're gonna answer the age-old question, is it working without simply relying on basic numbers or monthly statements? Stay tuned, we hope this helps. So in part three of this series on how to be an objective-based investor, we're gonna look at how to measure success. Again, the whole point of this series is, again, not discrediting the whys that people have, but understanding that those aren't actionable investment uh, strategies, and then nor are they effective ways to measure one strategy. What's a common why? As we talked about in week one, make money. Drilling down further, why do you want to make money? Well, I want to take that trip with my spouse. I want to educate my kids. I want to be able to retire with some measure of financial security later in life. Those are all critically important. We try to not only encourage those, but uncover them as part of the process. But again, they're not an effective way to evaluate portfolios, and we see the two confused all too often. Most of investing can come down to two critical questions for purposes of clients or that the clients have. Number one, am I okay? What that means is really, am I on track? Am I going to be able to experience many of those whys that I hope to have? That's really a planning question. My colleague Jake Tim did a great job um, in the video that he did right before we launched into this series. This series though, again, is dedicated to really that second question, is it working? Are those fundamental uh, investments within my portfolio doing what they should do? So we talked a little bit how we think through the construction piece. Now let's talk about how we think through the evaluation, the monitoring piece. Has some application up front, but certainly that much more of a powerful application as we go. Well, a gentleman named Harry Markowitz 50 years ago created and won a Nobel Prize in economics for the efficient frontier. What is that? Simply put, it is a way to measure, think through how much risk you're taking and how much reward you should get for that risk. Investing comes at a cost. Not only the initial money that you put up, but your patience, your emotional fortitude. Um, the volatility that one has to put up with during their course of an investor. But for doing all of those things, you should get an equal and commensurate rate of return. Well, how do you measure that? If you can measure that, it gives you a much better idea of is it working. So let's take a quick look at a chart here and walk through what we hope to see, but what we too often see with outside portfolios. As I stated, uh, and this being Harry's line here, you know, for every amount of risk you're taking within your portfolio, you should be getting some return, right? Money. And the question isn't really where you fall along the risk continuum. That's a very personal question. It comes back to that live methodology of thinking through what's right for you, what's the best fit. That's a little bit different for everyone. Um, but rather, if you're taking that amount of risk, are you getting all the potential return you should be getting over time. Is it a well-constructed portfolio as opposed to one that may be taking this much risk, but again, has a gap between what you're likely or are getting as a rate of return compared to what you should get? Yeah, at times, things can feel like this, right? When the stock market's just going up into the right or Netflix is just soaring off into the moon, it can feel like, and for a moment, there might not appear to be a lot of risk and just tons of return. The reality is mean reversion is a powerful investment truth. Long-term averages usually come back into play. One-off anecdotes, again, not a repeatable investment process. Part of what we do for our clients, whether they're prospective clients or existing clients, is measure and monitor those portfolios to make sure that, one, from a planning perspective, we've mapped how much risk they're gonna take for their portfolio, but then to build a portfolio that should hopefully maximize the rate of return that they can get for the risk they're taking, or again, if they're a prospective client, be able to see that. You can't tell whether something's working, hearkening back to video one, just based off whether it's making money. The market might not be up, right? But you can measure, are you getting the rate of return that you should be getting? Last year, if you were in an all US equity portfolio and didn't get the 20% the market bore, that should be troublesome. We've seen some portfolios that were taking a ton of risk, 
you know, and where last year maybe that was giving you 20%, they were down here at eight. So in talking about, again, having a US all, all US stock strategy that should have given you 20% last year, but maybe gave you eight if you weren't in the efficient portfolio, it's a perfect segue into how we evaluate individual managers, and it's just that. One word, context. People love to talk about benchmarking. They often misapply it. They'll use it with respect to a portfolio. Again, a portfolio should be a pretty customized personal, personal thing. And to compare one person's portfolio to another, or even one asset class to another, is really a misapplication that we see all too often. The question with benchmarking is, given the market conditions, whatever that context is, is that manager giving me everything that he or she can? And if the answer to that question is yes, and our thesis for why we want it in the first place still holds, then we're good, right? We're not just evaluating it on a month by month or even a year by year basis. We're keeping in mind our thesis, evaluating that manager's activity given the context that they find themselves in. And if those two things stay in alignment, that's where it becomes incumbent upon us to stay patient. With that, we hope you found this as help. If you're not a client, uh, we're happy to walk through, show you how this may apply to your portfolio. But again, in all this context, whether that's how much risk for return or on an asset class level, what has the market given that particular asset class? And are you, again, getting that commensurate rate of return? We'll see you next week where we'll close this up with the costs of failure.